as we have kids that say, oh, wow, you know, I can get a scholarship or I got to serve it. Well, yes, Dr. Sam is paying for your tuition. So there's some time you have to give back. But look at it this way. You have a guaranteed job. And what a lot of kids and we try to explain to families that there's a lot of companies and corporations out here that look looking for leaders. I mean, when you graduate as an officer, whether it's an ensign or a lieutenant, you're going to be in charge immediately of 30 to 50 people. A lot of people work their entire careers and never be in charge of more than three to five people. So having that experience when you're 22 to 23 years old, and if even if you only serve for two to four years, that makes you highly coveted in a private sector because they're looking for junior military officers who have that leadership experience so they can train up and be leaders in their organizations, or they can go out here and become entrepreneurs or go to law school, go to medical school, and they still can have that extra skill of leadership that they can develop their own companies. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Inner Wealth, the Forbes Ignite podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Kakal, CEO of Forbes Ignite. And every week I'll be sharing with you my conversations with unique, creative, and innovative people across all different industries. These are people who are intellectually curious explorers who are also redefining what it means to be successful today. From personal to professional, we cover it all to understand what drives our guests to blaze their own trails and create nimble solutions within the industries that touch each of our lives. Our guest today is Ishan Lanier, founder and executive director of Resolve Solutions Incorporated. He is a former U.S. Army aviator who has always dreamed of being a pilot. His dreams came true, and he became passionate about helping young leaders achieve their dreams as well. His nonprofit, Resolve Solutions, has helped hundreds of students receive over $60 million in offers. We talk about mentorship and support for underrepresented students, building students' academic confidence through their program, and so much more. I know you're going to love what he has to say. Here's our chat. Hey, Sean, how's it going? Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for having me on, Nicola, uh, opportunity to talk about Resolve. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much to talk about, so much ground to cover. And I've been looking forward to this conversation for so long. So tell me, what have you been up to lately? Well, most recently, I just got back from uh, South Bend, Indiana. I uh, was accepted into the Executive Master's in Nonprofit Administration at the University of Notre Dame through the uh, Mendoza School of Business. And what I found is as a nonprofit leader, not only do you have to be a continuous lifelong learner, but there's just some things that you know, I just didn't know when we started off in this journey. So uh, the program is the oldest program in the history of the Notre Dame Business School, but it puts you around above the other nonprofit leaders in a variety of sectors that goes back 65 years. So being around those folks that have kind of been there, done that, I felt that that was something that we needed to do to help us get to another level. Absolutely. And congratulations on the program. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. So tell us your story about how you got here. What was your personal and professional journey to where you are today? Well, interestingly enough, if you can close your eyes and think about it for a second, if you can imagine going to an air show and seeing a little boy that's about two years old and he's staring at the aircraft, you know, his nose is pressed up against the fence staring and the mom is trying to tug and get them to get into the shade or get up where they can have a better vantage point. I was I was that little boy. So I was very fortunate that I knew very early on in life what I wanted to do. And fortunately, I wasn't surrounded by family, uh, friends that told me what I couldn't do. So when I said I wanted to be a pilot early on, that was just kind of baked into the equation. So when I, I was able to successfully graduate high school, got accepted into the Virginia Military Institute, I was able to commission as Army Aviation as a pilot. From there, went through flight school. So my childhood dream became true. So it's a little bit fortuitous that now on the back end of my career, when I got close to retiring, I realized that my childhood dream was to become a pilot or an aviator. But my passion was to giving back and helping others, particularly kids. So I got to become somewhat of a dream maker. And that's kind of like the short version of, the, of how that progression went. That's incredible. And it's not every day that someone can say my dreams actually came to fruition and came true based on your lifelong decisions and everything that led up to that point. So that's amazing. So I'm curious, what inspired you and who were some of your heroes? I think that when you say as far as inspire, when, you know, again, that kid go back to the air show, when you're a kid that's two years old, you're not looking at a person's race or sex. So you just look at aircraft. You're fascinated by that dream of fly, uh, flying and you just went after it. So I think that being around that air show, my father was an army aviator. He was a medevac pilot, which is a short for medical evacuation. They flew out soldiers from the battlefield and he did that in Vietnam. 
So he actually took me up when I was like five years old. And if you remember the show MASH, there was these helicopters that came in, the medevac helicopters that come in, the bubble helicopters. But he took me out to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and took me flying. And imagine being in that bubble helicopter, and there's no doors, and you can think of the sensation of the wind. You got the rotors going <laughs> going above your head, the light, and you're thinking about, oh, man, am I going to fall out the aircraft? <laughs> But at the same time, you also had this thrill of looking at, you know, God's country from above. And and that's what stuck with you. So I think just being involved early on, that was, you know, I think pilots were my heroes. And you see the TV shows and you see, you know, it was more than just becoming pilots. They were great thinkers and leaders. So those type of things that I saw were kind of my quote unquote heroes, uh, folks who continue to serve others without thinking about themselves. That's incredible. I love that story. So thank you so much for sharing. And you said that apart from your dream of becoming a pilot, you also had that passion of helping kids. So your work at Resolve helps underrepresented students with college prep and financial support, for example. So what are some projects and success stories that you'd like to talk about? You know, if you go on our website, if you look at our Instagram page, you'll see a lot of success stories right off the bat, just different kids. And remember, we've had seven aviators now that are coming up, three that are Army, two that got selected for pilot slots in the Air Force, two in the Navy. Uh, We also had Dr. Uh, Bethany King-White, who went to VMI, ran track and cross country, majored in biology, but was accepted into dental school and graduated president of her dental school class. Wow. This this past May. And now she's doing her residency at Bon Secours Hospital in Richmond, Virginia, or Jonathan Gray, who was also a scholar athlete leader, got an athletic scholarship, but also had an ROTC scholarship. And now he's starting Penn State Law this fall. Or Holly Jabo, we recruited her out of California in high school. Didn't know that she was not a U.S. citizen at the time, but she came to school, chose a school of her choice, majored in biology. She's working her master's, but She's one of our nation's newest U.S. citizens. You know, the benefit of being a U.S. citizen now, now she's eligible for the Health Professional Scholarship Program or HPSP scholarship. Uh, She wants to go to an HBCU medical school and have that experience. But if she's accepted to the program, she'll be able to go to medical school fully and fully funded and also receive $2,000 a month as a stipend while she's going through medical school. So there's a, a we've helped over 550 kids earn about $61 million in offers. So there's a, a number of kids that are success stories that we've had, and we just hope to build upon that and expand it. That's incredible. And you've obviously made such a huge impact in these people's lives. And I know you mentioned that there are also ROTC scholarships involved. So For those in the audience that aren't as familiar, can you explain the ROTC program? Well, ROTC is short for Reserve Officer Training Corps that was started after World War I. So it goes back well over 100 years. And essentially, in in exchange for service, students have to take while in college uh, to be enrolled at a college which has an ROTC program. And the majority of ROTC is based upon leadership. There is some uh, small unit tactics and some training and going out of field training exercise, but 80% of the coursework is about building better, stronger, capable leaders. DOD offers ROTC scholarships uh, to the tune of about $750 million per year. That's all four branches of service. But in exchange, you know, that'll pay for tuition and fees. Uh, there's a combination of getting a four-year, three-year, two-year, or even a one-year scholarship. So there's opportunities for kids to earn an ROTC scholarship, even if they don't get an offer coming out of high school based upon their GPA. What it doesn't cover is the room board cost. So there's a little bit of a delta there. In exchange for every year that they're on ROTC scholarship, there's one year of service uh, commitment they have to have at the duty, or if they go into the Guard and Reserve, it's what we call one for two. For every year on scholarship, they have two years of service. And I want to zero in on a statistic that you told me in our last conversation that the DOD spends about $750 million on ROTC scholarships, but there's only about a 52% success rate. So why do you think that is? Well, the largest scholarship provider out of DOD is definitely Army. They have the largest mandate requirements, so they have a 52% success rate. And success is defined as a kid that gets the ROTC scholarship out of high school, that goes to college, actually graduates college and becomes a commissioned officer. A lot of that is attributed, you know, from our studies is from the lack of mentorship and the lack of support. 
And then the third thing is finances. When we say lack of mentorship and support, you got to remember that only 2% of our nation has served in the military. So there's just a lot of kids that may come in that haven't heard that story from their uncle or they didn't have those, you know, we joke around and say those war stories. But those war stories are powerful because it creates a sense of belonging. Because if you heard that story 20, 30, 40 times, then when you get that situation, you have something to refer to. Uh, when we talk about the lack of mentorship, there's professional organizations that provide mentorship that can provide that connectivity that we try to introduce kids to. For those who have that experience, and can help explain some of that, been there, done that. And when we talk about finances, a lot of the ROTC scholarships used to be fully funded, but now they're only funding tuition and fees, but there's a room and board costs. And each school varies in accordance to their own tuition and fee structure. So it's not uncommon that you can go to a private institution, a very expensive institution where the room and board costs may cost more than it does at a, say, for example, in-state school. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of folks will try to say, hey, well, they should go to the cheapest school possible, a degree is a degree. And it's it's not it's not that simple. Sometimes that's the students and their parents go on campus. They may have a better feel for the campus. They may have a good rapport with their faculty. The, the school may have a low student teacher ratio and maybe a little bit more expensive, or each school's had different financial aid opportunities. And then they say, Well, just go to the school that's the cheapest. Because what we really want that student to do is have a great college experience that they want to be there because that's where they're gonna have the greatest chance of being successful. Absolutely. So tell us about the process that Resolve has established to help underrepresented students. As far as our process, we depend a lot on what we call local champions. We don't necessarily go out and recruit kids. What works better for us if we recruit people who have access to kids. So that's working with folks that are JRTC instructors, which are reserve officer training corps, not the senior folks that are in a senior ROTC, which is in colleges, but this is the high school level. These organizations, they're not designed to put people in the military, but they're more civic oriented. There's a lot of organizations, folks who have access to kids. From there, based off those relationships, they can be the ones who have firsthand experience on what's the the qualities of the kid. We can look at the grades and the test scores, but what we're really looking for, do they have the grit? Do they have the stick to itness to complete a task when they start to finish? Or sometimes they may see something in a kid that's a great kid, but the kid hasn't realized their own potential. So we depend on those folks, what we call local champions, to identify those kids that may have that potential that they don't see in themselves. So from there, once we identify those folks in, in, in high school, help them navigate the process because DOD is a bit of a stickler on getting paperwork in on time. You know, they really don't care if your your cat died or, you know, you got some issues. There's a there's typically a timeline with an open period and closed period. And you have to meet those things. But once they get the scholarship, we try to connect them with those professional mentorship organizations I spoke of before. What we try to do is connect kids with the partner organizations that have military affiliations. You know, we look at AFCOMA, Air Force Cadet Officer Mentoring Association, we work with folks that are going into the Air Force or in in a way that has folks that are going into the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, or the ROTS Incorporated, which focuses primarily on Army. And then you also have a newer organization, militarymentors.org, which actually is a joint organization. It's a little bit more, a little bit younger, more Generation Z and millennials, but they're more joint and have a representation from all the branches of service. But bottom line is that all of these organizations have great leaders and folks that have been there, done that from the 01 level all the way up to four-star general. So that's a great opportunity to connect parents and the kids to these folks who have been there, done that. Then after we connect them with those folks, what we try to do is provide funding or scholarships for students to go to summer's type of summer bridging program prior to their freshman year. The purpose of that is to improve the retention rates. So if you have a student that come on campus, goes to summer school, takes three to six credit hours, you can then work on it and help in improving their academic confidence, help build a relationship between faculty members and the student and the parents, and then also introduce them to some local alumni in front of school. So they have a, a stronger support network when they come back on campus in the fall. After their freshman year, we try to provide funding for them to go to summer school again and say, well, why go to summer school after your freshman year? Well, because after your freshman year, that's typically kind of like a dead summer because you don't have enough credit hours to get an internship. So instead of going home and sitting on the couch, go to summer school, continue to improve on your grades, if you have a 2.5 GPA better, we want to see you apply for a language immersion program to go to the country of your choice, because what that does is it enhances your resume 
So after your sophomore year, you're much more competitive for an internship uh, after your sophomore year and junior year. We understand that there's a military commitment over the course of your summers right there, but that's typically about two to four weeks, depending on the, your branch of service and the type of training. But you also have those few other weeks in there where you can get an internship. So it's great when you talk to a kid and say, hey, I'm interested in becoming cybersecurity officer for any branch of service. And they say, well, why do you want to do that? They say, well, I saw this great commercial on TV with the mom and the daughter. And it's like, okay, stop. I saw the commercial. It was great. But it would be a lot more competitive if you were a computer science, IT major, something along those lines. After you're academically strong, after your freshman year, say, for example, you went to China. Then after your sophomore year, you did your training and you got an internship with Hilton Worldwide, working as a cybersecurity officer. And after your junior year, you work for another Fortune 500 company or you go work for a university or work for a local company back home working at IT security. Continue to build your resume so when you get assessed to become an officer and you're being looked at by that branch of service, they can see your body of work and say, ah, this student is a better fit and they can contribute more and they're more well-rounded. So ultimately, that's the kind of the process is that you identify these students to have the talent, the skills, the capability to get into school. But how do we make sure they're well-rounded and more successful so when they come out and become a leader, they're more, much more confident and capable and in instituting their craft? So it sounds like there are many avenues people can take when they're in their undergraduate careers. And you are essentially taking the guesswork out of this process and it works. It's helped over 550 students so far in the program. So kudos to you. No, I appreciate that. We've had a lot of success, but to be and honest, despite the results that you've seen, there is so much room that we can do to be better. We haven't had the funding from private donors and corporations in order to fully enhance the model of sending kids to summer school and providing those scholarships to go to language immersion and do those things. Going back to that degree for Notre Dame, my longer term goal is to go back and receive my doctorate because we have the body of work that we've had kids from various commissioning sources, you know, the service academies, senior military colleges, HBCUs, and a variety of other schools. So now we need to kind of codify that and put it into a study to show what are the outcomes. And I think that, you know, I don't want to get ahead of it, but my firm belief is that if you provide the amount of wraparound support on the front end, you'll have a much more capable officer, but you'll also reduce the cost for our taxpayer dollars because you just have higher uh, success rates. No, that is brilliant. And when you finish the study, which is how many years from now? Well, I have my, uh, my fingers and toes crossed right now, but <laughs> if everything goes well, we'll uh, be finished with my studies at Notre Dame late summer and then start the EDD program that fall which uh, uh, 2023, and that's a three-year program. So hopefully by 2026, but we hope to have those studies in place well before we earn a degree. I can't wait to explore that because it sounds really fascinating. And a lot of people could really benefit from the model that you've built and learn so much about what you've already done and what success they can have in their own organizations as well. So what's next for Resolve Solutions? We're trying to get our recruiting schedule for the fall, uh, really barnstorming the country. The educational sector has really taken a hit. A lot of teachers that have retired, people that have moved on. So we really need to get back out to our ground roots and figure out, you know, who's still in place, establish some new friends, new communities, because you have a new crop of kids that post-COVID need to be exploring these opportunities. After that, you know, we're also looking at uh, fundraising campaigns to raise funds to have a permanent staff. That means having uh, more monthly subscribers of at least $25 a month. And for those who don't understand the nonprofit sector, if you can take care of your overhead, then you're much more eligible for grants, donor advised funds, those type of things that can help raise the number of scholarships that you can hand out. Also looking at partnerships with different colleges and universities, because what we found is that when we have kids that come in in larger groups or as teams, there's a higher retention rate there. So there's about 15 HBCUs that we're looking at partnering with, as well as some senior military colleges. And then we're also excited about some potential opportunities to partner with Notre Dame, which has some grad school opportunities as you know, getting kids that are one to two years out of finishing college to get a master's degree in, say, analytics or marketing or nonprofit administration, like what I'm working on, so I can find a successor for what I'm doing. But those things I'm pretty excited about because we know that about 30 to 40% of kids would not go active duty. So for a lot of kids that may go into the Guard and Reserve, 
They may go to the military training and then we may be able to assist them with getting into somewhere like University of Notre Dame or grad school to carry on with their uh, professional career in addition to their military service. When I'm taking a step back, let's think about the big why for Resolve. I think for us, if we're successful or uh, getting to our goal of 500 students per year and having a minimum of a 70% success rate, that five-year cohort is about 2,100 students that would earn about $160 million toward their undergraduate tuition. If you look at that and understand that you know, our goal is to have about 50% of them go to a historically Black college and university, we know that 30 40% will go into the National Guard and Reserve. But the bigger picture is that that's an estimated lifetime earned income of about $735 million to $1 billion. Each veteran earns a, a VA certificate where they can purchase a home with no money down. That VA certificate is worth about $1 million if it's used properly. Right now, only 15% of veterans use the VA certificate. But for that cohort, that's about $2 trillion worth of generational wealth creation through home ownership. You're also talking about another 100 to $160 million of GI Bill benefits, specifically that they can use toward their graduate degrees. Even if the service member doesn't use their graduate degree, they can pass that benefit along to their spouse. So imagine a young couple that you can send your spouse to law school and medical school or, you know, get their graduate degree. But that raises the family's lifetime earned income as well. So when you take a look at all of that added in, if you use a 2% give back rate on that total lifetime earned income, that's about 14 to $30 million giving back to the respective bubble models. So for us as a nonprofit, it's really about the larger picture of like the kids that we're recruiting right now that would become future leaders. They're going to give back in a multitude of ways back to just their contribution to military services to their communities and to our nation. Wow, that is incredible. And I don't think a lot of people really realize that. The secondary or tertiary effects of the work that you're doing has a huge impact. So thank you for what you do. Oh, thank you for having on and allowing us to tell our story. And hopefully others will listen and figure out ways to help out or help us move toward helping us become more successful. Absolutely. And what would you say to anyone who's interested in being involved in Resolve? Well, I would definitely say, please, please, please check out our social media. We have our website, ResolveSolutions.org. Also connect with us on Facebook, follow us on LinkedIn, my personal page, and also check us out on Instagram um, and just drop us a note. We depend a lot on those who have hands on their kids and identify that those young future leaders for us. And I ask this question to all of my guests on the podcast. So how would you define success? I think success is defined as that, you know, maybe you know, 15, 20 years from now, I'm in, in a rocking chair somewhere, uh, hopefully not on oxygen assist, but I can look up on the news or see some kids or get a note from a kid that say, hey, thank you. Or, hey, this is what we're doing right now. And they will have graduated, uh, had great success in careers, represented their family and our nation well, started their own families. Um, I think that's success and knowing that, you know, we've we played a small part in taking the baton and passing on to the next generation. Well, Sean, it has been such a pleasure speaking with you. And I cannot wait to hear more about your progress and how Resolve is expanding its network. Oh, thank you so much for having me and look forward to chatting with you soon. That's it for this week's episode of Inner Wealth. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and that you'll join us next week as we continue to explore all the ways success is being redefined in our ever-changing world. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on your favorite podcast app. And follow us on Instagram at Forbes Ignite for more thought-provoking content and opportunities to engage with us. I'm your host, Nicole Kakal. Thanks for joining us.